We video lecture on the use of the electro-pneumatic section of fluid sim. Um, so what we want to just concentrate on is a few different types of features that you may uh, sort of come across. Um, that you may be asked to obviously be building within your uh, coursework, for instance. Um, so obviously on fluid sim, uh, I've started a new tab. I've got rid of the uh, library window, hierarchical view. Um, I always use the F3 button. Hopefully the keystrokes are being recorded in this. You should be able to see everything as I type. Um, so what I want to start off with is um, a wee bit of text just to uh, let's get this in caps. Text just to show the sort of circuit that we want to be working with. So I want um, to have one by the vacuum cylinder. And the way I want that controlled, let's find a new line, um, via a normally open push to make and returned this new line via something similar, another normally open push to mech and we're not really going to specify just too much currently right now um, about the type of control valves or buttons etc and so on but we have a rough idea of what should be happening um, so let's just get the pneumatic side of things done first of all so anytime you do have the electro pneumatics always figure out what the pneumatic side of things uh, currently so do we search and we're obviously going to need a double acting cylinder so find that on your chart uh, don't really know what the difference between those two are um, I don't think there's a single bit of difference within the software. But anyway, put it in and let's label it straight away under the actuating label. Let's call this an A. Uh, we'll go A in the minus position. So it begins at zero, ends at zero. Uh, so basically only when it's fully retracted. And we have A in the plus position, which is 100 and 100 because it's a double acting cylinder. Um, the ones by default in the software are 10 centimeters long or 100 mil long. Um, we can add those in. So we've got our, our 5.2, or not our 5.2, our double acting cylinder uh, ready to go. So we need to control it somehow. Um, again, I know we're working with uh, electro pneumatics, so we still have to design the electrical side of things, obviously. But right now, we can still add in the 5.2 valve that controls it. Um, we obviously want one that is solenoid operated. Um, just by thinking through that I have one push button to control it one way and one the other, um, more than likely we're going to be looking to have um, this 5.2 solenoid impulse valve. There's a few others there, it's a spring return. Um, one is solenoid valve, where the right hand side one is pilot air operated return. Uh, and again, a few other different types there, but we're looking at the impulse valve in this in this instance. Let's just zoom in a wee touch as well. Um, connect those up, extend port to port four, and the retract port to port two. Um, let's get a compressed air supply hooked on to the bottom, like so. And you can go on and set that uh, megapascal. You can set the bar if you so wish. So it's going to be six. We'll set ours to five. You don't have to change it. I'm just showing you that you can. Um, so to control this. Um, that one push button sends it out and a different button pushes it back in. We need to get some of the electrical components. We need a 24 volt connection, so let's get that in. And we're also going to then require a zero volt connection. And again, let's dump that in. We need obviously the push button itself. So push button. And we're looking at a push button mech, like so. And let's put that in, label it up with extend. And make sure the writing doesn't cross over anywhere. And now, to connect this direct, uh, let's just finish off designing this actually very quickly. Uh, retract for that particular one. And again, make sure the lines aren't touching anywhere. Now, if we wanted to extend to make obviously the valve control the extension of the double acting cylinder, 
what we need to do is have this item here, which is the valve solenoid, controlled electrically wise. So we need to search for valve solenoid. So even when you type in valve solenoid, it actually comes up near the bottom, the bit you're looking for. Make sure it's the, the one here uh, used in the ladder program, or the, sorry, the electrical program. And if we connect that in there, it still won't do anything just yet. Um, let's just get a second one in there. Copy and paste. Square things up, make it nice and neat. Still won't do anything currently because nothing's associated with one another. So let's go to label this one, click on the uh, green bit. So 1M1, um, try that again, 1M1. 1M2 and you also need then to associate these ones with the same so 1M1 and 1M2 and if I hit play on this one you'll see that by default the air supply the, the pressure is going along and making the cylinder retract um, so if I press the extend button here you'll see that even when I let go, it stays in the same position because it's a double solenoid valve. It doesn't return back. Um, it activates 1M1, which activated this valve solenoid, which then activates the valve to now make air go from port 1 to port 4, obviously then extending the cylinder. And then I could have the retract button here, and you see something very similar happening on the retract side obviously activating the other one. Now, this one's known as direct control, where the push button or whatever your activation method is, is directly connected to the valve solenoid. Now, generally speaking, we don't want to do that. So what we want to do is indirectly control them through a relay. So I'll just replace this one first. Um, we're still going to want this item. So just delete the lines out that is currently connected and just move it over for now. What I want to place in is a relay. This is how we get our indirect control. Select the relay and put it in place of where you just took out the valve solenoid from. And label it up, the standard convention is K, and then the first one is 1, so K1. And then let's connect this other one back in. And this time, the control switch over here needs to be, needs to be a contact from the relay. So we can search for that. And it's called mech, it's a mech contact or mech switch. So it looks like that there. And you can place it in there. If you click on the relay itself, you see that the corresponding component of electrical circuits is normally open, normally closed, or change over. That's the three symbols there. Normally open, which is the mech contact, normally closed, which is called brec contact. Then this one here is a changeover. You can search for each of those in between. So for instance, you could search for um, uh, search for brec. You see the brick switch come up like that, and change over, change over switch. So that's, that's the three types of ones you could use within this. We're interested in the mech contact uh, that I have here. You need to label it the same thing as the item it's being controlled by. And you can see here the corresponding component of electrical. There's maybe possibly other electrical switches or relays or timer relays, that one is. So no, oh, I didn't label the whole thing. So K1 it needs to be. And if I connect it up the power up here, connect that back down there. So you see, the way it was before, just straighten these up a little bit, that we have, and these as well, so that's everything sort of lined up. As before, we had in this rung, which is rung number one, you see it labeled at the top, that it was a push button directly into the valve solenoid. This time it's now the push button into the relay and the relay closes its contacts, and activates this set, which then indirectly controls the, uh, the valve solenoid. And you see down the bottom, down the bottom here, the, the, the contacts showing you which um, rungs have what types of connections. So you see here a normally open contact, which is the bit on the right, is shown on network number three. So there is the normally open on network number three. So that's how you can start to trace out where all the child contacts from this parent contact um, is found at within the circuit. 
So if we turn this one now on, you see that it still operates exactly the same way. We press the button, activates the relay. The relay then closes this K1 over here, and then obviously operates a 1M1. And when I let go, then it goes off, but it obviously still stays out because of the type of uh, valve we're using. Now, we could do that for the other one as well, so let's just change that to the way we had just changed the previous one. So move it over. Let's get a second relay in. Copy and paste that one. Remember to relabel it because we copied it. So that needs to be K2, so the second number along. Connect that in. And something similar over here again. Um, make contact. Let's, let's put that one there. Squared up a little bit. And linked in. So now we have K1 and K2, K1 and K2 up here. And then obviously 1M1 and 1M2, which is the two valve solenoids. So we have this, and we're able to then operate extending and retracting. So it works exactly the same, basically, as before, except now we have this thing called indirect control. So one of the problems we have with this type of circuit is that if I were able to, if you hold the shift button here and press extend, if you also press that one, the second button, you see that both solenoids are on together here, which is wrong. You shouldn't. That shouldn't ever happen. That's both of these uh, solenoids are trying to compete against one another to move the spool inside the valve to a new position. Um, generally speaking, whatever position it is in before is the way it stays if both of them are activated at exactly the same time. So that's a big no-no. So we want to be able to try to limit that. And the way we do that is by the means of um, electrical interlocks, it's called. Okay. So what we need to make sure is that when one relay is operated, for instance, K1, we have this here circuit here under network 2 broken somehow so that K2 can activate. So what we need to do then is actually put a normally closed of K1 in here. So let's search for a brick. Brick switch. Place it in there. And it's going to be labelled K1. And we do the same for this one in here. So I could just copy and paste that one. And obviously remember to relabel. K2. So now you can see that if I press and operate uh, this one on the left, so it goes down through, goes down through K2 because it's normally closed, activates K1, K1 closes here and activates 1M1 and the cylinder extends, which is, which is what we wanted. But now what's critical is this K1 here and the arrow showing you that it's operated has now gone open. So it was normally closed, so remember go back to your original, when the circuit's off you see both of these are normally closed. But when you activate the extend switch, then if you activate the retract as well, this time nothing happens. So even if you press both together, only one of the relays is on. But more critically, only one of the valve solenoids is on. So you're not going to burn out doing anything. Okay, so that's how to get it to go in and out using two buttons. Okay, thinking of a different situation this time. Um, what about if we had, instead of a double acting cylinder here, or a double acting, sorry, a 5-2 double solenoid valve, that we only had a single solenoid. So that means the opposite side is the spring return. So let's just get rid of that one and place in the appropriate one. So a 5-2. Um, let's see if I can find the correct one. So there is one there. Solenoid valve is third and down in, on the option in the search for 5-2. Uh, let's place that into the appropriate place. And into there. So now this we one here will be one M one. So that means that when we activate one M one, and we can still use the same circuit just as a very quick test to show how things work. Now if we press the button, it extends. But this time, when we let go, it now retracts. Okay. So if we want to do that to still basically provide the same principle of going out and it stays out, and then we press a different button or the retract as I've called it here um, then it goes back and we need to do something slightly different it's called a latching circuit we need to be able to latch this so if we just get rid of uh, the majority of these components we may as well just delete them here uh, 
think it's handy as any. So this time we have the extend button. So back to basics, we want the valve solenoid. So search for the valve solenoid and insert that component down to here and up to there. And it needs to be labeled 1M1. So even if we just connect now, you see it goes out, let go, goes back in. But really what we want is to press the button and let go and it goes and stays out. And then basically on the way back in, you need to press a different one. So the best way to solve this is to go straight away and have indirect control. So remember the indirect control was not having this directly below and rather we had the relay instead. So let's find the relay and stick it, it in. In there. Let's call it K1. And we need a MEC contact. MEC switch. And again, it needs to be labelled what the relay is, so K1. And it extends down to 1M1 and down again. So we now have this, if we hit play here, we now have this indirect control, but it's still not latching. So to make something latch, we need to bypass whatever our starting condition is. So the starting condition still starts the sequence, it activates the output, and then we bypass the starting condition again. So we need a secondary make contact that bypasses like that the start condition. Now this would be a, a bit of a fault really, but you see the principle. I press it, it goes down through, activates K1, closes this switch and the one here, activates 1M2 and the cylinder here goes out, it, it, it extends. But the problem with this is we can't turn it off, we have no way of, you know, turning it off. So we press extend, does nothing, and the only way to do it is actually to actually isolate the power. So what we really need is a break in here of the circuit of the retract button. And the retract button this time, in reality, needs to be a break switch this time. Because it needs to be normally closed so the power actually goes through it. Uh, push button break, that's what we want there. So this is now becoming more like a start and stop button this time. Where the stop button is usually wired, normally closed. Okay, retract. And again, make sure the lines aren't crossing. We now press play and we can hit extend. It goes out and stays out. And then we can hit retract and it goes back in. Okay. Now, if you were asked to make the speed of the cylinder adjustable, the way you would do that is let's just move that up a bit because we need a wee bit of space in here. We're going to delete these lines out here, which is the, the output lines from the valve, and we're going to insert uh, flow control valves. One way flow control valve, that's the one there. So let's just paste one in there. And you see it's sort of sitting the wrong way. So we need to rotate this first of all, and let's rotate it, uh, do, 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 I forget which way. But we need to figure it out. So if we place that there, let's think about this. The air would be coming out of four, for instance. Let's just have a look here. So air will be coming up through here. It goes left, and it pushes the wee ball out of the way. So it's unrestricted going that way. Although there is a restriction there, it's more likely to take the easiest path, a bit like electric, it takes the easiest path. Um, things in general don't really like doing the hard bits. So if the air was coming up through here, so in its, in its activated position, the air would come straight up, go left, up through the wee ball cock, straight up through, and push that out. Okay, that's unrestricted, that's the way we want it. So when it came back the other way, so for instance the way it is right now, the air will come up through, go through here, push in, the air in the back of the cylinder gets forced out through, it tries to go this way, and it's blocked, it goes straight down through, through the restriction. And you can set the restriction to a certain percentage. So for instance 5%, okay, just double click, change your percentage up here, or you can move the slider, whatever you so wish. Just highlight hit a certain number, 5%, like so. And that means on the retract side, this is going to slow down. So let's just have a quick look at this. We press the button, it goes out, 
just as fast as ever. Let's so press retract, and you see it very slowly retract as the, the exit air that's being exhausted out of the back of the cylinder is being restricted on the way out. That's called metering out. You always want to try to meter out, don't meter in. Metering in is when you restrict the flow of air in to the, to the cylinder to slow it down. And really, you always want to restrict the air coming out. Okay, so let's place one on the other side as well. So copy and paste that one. Now we know it's the right way around. Place it in that way and in there. And you can change it, to, let's say it's 10% for this one and 5% for the other. So you should now see that the extend is quicker than what the retract is. So press the button, you see it goes out, still reasonably quick. Press retract and you see definitely visibly slower on the way back in. So you could use that to try and get timing. So if you're told, for instance, that the extend had to be one second, it's probably a little bit still less than one second in that case, and the retract had to be two seconds, for instance, then that's how you go about solving that. So what about if you wanted to, instead of controlling it via a button, as in a return, that actually used the sensor of A plus to make it a return instead. So how would we go about doing that? So let's make some changes to the circuit. Let's just get rid of some of the stuff we had in before. Keep it uh, repeating all the time here. Make things a little bit easier for us. So let's go back, first of all, to the more simpler way of doing it with the standard 5.2 valve. And stick in a 5.2 uh, solenoid impulse, like so and connect up to our flow control valves and there and let's level these up with 1M1 and 1M2 1M2 so again let's keep this really simple um, let's do the direct control first of all just to make sure we see how easy it is um, so we're looking for a valve solenoid initially um, so let's find that one there and put it in now this valve solenoid is going to come off of the extend button and it's going to be 1m1 so we still want it to extend when the um, push button is pressed but what we also want to make sure is that it only comes back when it achieves full stroke so instead of having the push button as before um, which would have made it return this time, instead of being a push button, making a return, it's now the limit switch. So we look for um, basically the limit here, A+. plus. We're going to be a sensor connected here, so corresponding components. We're going to have this here, which is the magnetic proximity sensor. So it could be, so let's look for PROX, P-R-O-X. And let's look for the magnetic proximity sensor. And that's the one that's mounted on the cylinder itself. So again, keep it nice and simple. Connect live up at the top. Um, the one there needs to go to neutral at the bottom, so zero volt. And then this third line here, that's the signal. And it's, need to, it's going to need to control 1M2. So let's take a copy of this and just re-label it. Put it in at the same height as that one. And adjust the height. Connect up there, down to there. And call it 1M2. I just realized that this one here is labeled wrong, 1M1. So 1M1, 1M2. So now you press the button, it's going to activate 1M1. That activates this here, which sends the cylinder out. When the cylinder's fully out, we need to label this one here as A+, plus, because that's what we labeled up here, the A plus part of the sensor. So when the cylinder's fully extended, that would activate that, which sends the signal out of here to control 1M2 and send it back. So if you have a wee look here, press the button, it goes out. This one activates 1M2 and it goes back in. Out and back in. Okay, remember that the retract speed was two times slower. So if I just keep them the same, 10% each, just to make things a lot easier to see. Extend and retract. Now, you might have the case that if we hold the extend button, we have this thing that it stays stuck in the out position despite it achieving full stroke and it should come back. So what we want to do is 
we need to have more starting conditions, as in more things in the way of 1M1 before it actually activates. So what we really need here is not only the start button to be pressed, but also that A needs to be in the minus position. So we can use another one of these. Let's copy and paste that out. And we can feed that into, for instance, there. So that provides power to A minus this time. And then the signal continues on to 1M1, just as before, pretty much. Let's just move this over, tidy up a little bit. Connected there. Yep, everything seems okay. So now we see it here. The only thing active is the A plus sensor. It's not actually giving a signal out, it's just powered up. A minus isn't even powered up yet until we press the, the extend button. And you can see it still operates, goes out and in. This time, when I press and hold, it still allows it to come back in. But if I press and hold, it now runs in a cycle doing the, the full cycle this time at least. Okay, and only when I let go does it stop. So we could have, for instance, as an example, we could change that to a detent switch. So if I delete that out and add in, let's do for a search, and it is a push button And we're looking at the mech, it's not quite the right one, detent, detent switch mech, that's what we're looking there, detent switch mech, uh, you can search for that and place it in, and obviously just connect up to where it was before, um, and this really is now a start cycle. Okay, so when you press the button, it keeps the switch in, so I don't even need to press and hold it anymore, I just press it once and it stays in. And then I keep running until I press that button again, and then it's going to stop. So that's a way of making that system cyclic, that's a very easy way of making it cyclic. Now, I can make it cyclic quite easily again, but instead of having this as direct contact, the way these are, we should be going indirect. So let's just change this current circuit to indirect control. So I'm going to delete these lines out here and here and also the neutral connections just going to move these out over the way for a little minute and I want to replace those with relays so let's get the relay from our catalogue and place them in and again they should be labelled with K's so first one, K1 do we copy paste paste that one in there where the 1M2 used to be and change it to K2 and now we need some mech contacts because we're using the relay we obviously need to use the mech contacts and we'll need two of those copy and paste the one I just put in link those up to our 24 volt like so Let's sort of square them up a little bit uh, like so there down to 1M1 link up the neutrals so to complete the circuit 1M1, 1M2, and obviously finish off the labelling. So the first one was from K1. So this one from the A minus and the start cycle button, K1, activate 1M1. And then A plus activates K2, which activates this one. K2, which activates 1M2. So it should be pretty much the same operation. Except now, this time, they're just going indirect via relays to the valve solenoids instead of direct control.